Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. The people who are successful in real estate, a lot of times they've demonstrated success somewhere else in their life. Yeah. So it's easy to bring, you just got to bring over the real estate skill sets. Right. So many of these guys that are looking for their ticket out of poverty with real estate, I'm like, man, brother, you are so far behind. Just one of the things I like that you said is discipline. So many people lack discipline. How do you teach discipline? Welcome to the show. You are listening to the Real Estate Lab podcast. In this lab, we decode the stories, secrets, and skills of the most brilliant minds in real estate investing, then turn their wisdom into practical advice and knowledge that we can use to boost our income. And now, let's turn it over to our host, V. It's a great day to be alive and to invest in real estate. My name is Viku, and you're now listening to my show, The Real Estate Lab Podcast. Hello, hello. How are you doing, my friend? I hope you're doing fantastic. It's March, which means we're finishing the first quarter of 2020. Are you still crushing it? Hey, at times, I know things can be hard. You will feel like quitting sometimes. But hey, don't give up just yet. I've recently had an opportunity to briefly chat with Dr. Greg Reed, co-author of the book, Three Feet from Goal. This book is full of inspiring stories from wildly successful business personalities. Many of these people could have given up you know, just before they found their success, but they did not. And I'm sure you're not going to either. Believe in yourself. You are so close to getting whatever you desire. Keep on digging, my friends. Your goal could be just three feet away from where you are standing today. All right, enough about the book and my excitement for it. Let's talk about our guests today. So who do we have with us today? To start, one of them is a developer. He launched his consulting firm in 2007, began rehabbing Fannie and Freddie properties in Southern California. In fact, he flipped over 200 homes in that market. Then he moved his operation to Jersey as he saw potential there. And then now he is working in the red hot Houston market. His counterpart is someone who is equally impressive. He joined a local real estate club, bought his first deal and hasn't looked back since. In the past five years, his team has closed over 500 deals. His counterpart is someone who is equally impressive. He joined a local real estate club, bought his first deal, and has looked back since. In the last five years, his team has closed over 500 deals. I'm so excited to introduce to you our guests for today, Mr. Robert Ofino and Jason Bible. They are the hosts of the Texas Real Estate Radio Network air weekday evening on Houston AM 1070 The Answer from 9 to 11 p.m. These guys have some impressive knowledge, especially in the area of how to find deals. Everyone know the apartment market is really hot right now, has really low inventory, yet somehow they managed to find success in buying them around Houston, Texas. I'm sure you will enjoy this episode as much as I did recording it. Without further ado, let's turn it over to this week's content with Robert Ofino and Jason Bible. Hey, welcome to another edition of the Real Estate Lab podcast. I have the host of a radio show in Texas, the Texas Real Estate Radio Network, Mr. Jason Bible and Robert Orfino. How are you guys doing? We're good. Right? Awesome. Awesome. So to start with the show, I usually want to build a little bit of a context for the audience. Um, Robert, Jason, if we were buddies in high school and we're having lunch right now, what kind of conversation we'll be having and we'll be chatting right now? We'll be talking about music. Uh, that's interesting. Um, my lunches are short because I was always on the basketball court or something like that. So I, didn't, I was much in of a 
sit down and chat, hang out kind of guy during lunch. Yeah, I was a ticket scalper during high school. So we'd be talking about music, shows, live performances. Yep. So how did... That's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) How did you guys go from someone who was into music and and now in a a basketball court and, um, you know, going to a field that um, a lot of introverts are in? You know, real estate investing is not sexy. It's not uh, fun. Uh, I'll go first. Um, I was broke and in massive debt, and um, I didn't know what else to do. So I went to a real estate club, and I started, you know, breaking it down, reverse engineering, figuring out what was actually happening. And uh, I got into it pretty quickly. Um, I did have the benefit of being a third generation contractor. So I did not understand that aspect of it. And um, I was blessed to get involved with folks that were flipping Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then we moved on and we started flipping for the hedge fund. So, um, yeah, I was massively in debt. And uh, every single bad thought that everyone was having back in 2010, 2011, when you're near half a million in personal debt, uh, I was having. And so I went into real estate because... Uh, that was the only thing that was available to me that I could kind of figure out in the short term. So you, you went into real estate to get out of debt? Yes. Okay. Still working on it. But it's <laughs> debt at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Jason you, has Jason? much more, re- much more <laughs> adult story <laughs> how he got started. So, Jason, how did you get started? Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I worked in the, in the corporate world and, uh, you know, I always wanted to start a business. And one of the things that's attractive about real estate is it's self-collateralizing. So it's not like, you know, I got to beg, borrow and steal money to start a restaurant or pray some bank will give me some money. It's pretty easy in real estate. We know what the asset is worth right now. We know what it's worth when it's all fixed up. So for me, I always wanted to start a business and, and real estate was a, a gateway to do that. And sorry, I forgot to ask, how exactly did you two meet and become partner, business partners? We we met through a, a common associate. Um, you know, we had done the masterminds and the other events, and um, we just hooked up. And uh, I was looking for a new market and was looking at Houston, and I found uh, Jason and his uh, partner at the time, Tom. They were uh, hands down had the smartest real estate education program I've ever seen in my life. Um, and getting to know Jason over that short term, I realized this guy was. You know, he was a genius at this level, right? And uh, I'm not going to give him too big of a head. That's like being the, <laughs> the tall kid in kindergarten, yeah. right? But, <laughs> right? But he was really, really smart and came at things from a different angle. And I just said, okay, this is a guy I want in my circle. And, um, you know, three years later, we're, we're partners. And so, Jason, you, um, what Robert said earlier, you had a pretty big uh, educational company with um was it in compete in competition with lifestyle was also out of houston um uh, not not really we um so my i had a business partner tom perry and uh tom and i built uh, a couple of companies one of them was called houston house buyers and we flipped about 100 to 150 houses a year and uh, we had an education company that really taught the business end of running a real estate business so it's not you know lifestyles is quote passive income and uh we weren't really teaching that we were really teaching like how to build a flipping business how to build a rental portfolio you know how to build a real business not just you know buying a couple of rental properties and and praying you make money on by the end of the month so uh in 2018 uh over the course of that year i sat down with my business partner i said look i want to build real wealth here this house flipping business is great and all this education company is fantastic but you're not going to be able, you can't build wealth with either one of those. Things. You can make a lot of money, but you're not going to build any real wealth. And so uh, he ended up buying me out of those companies uh, in September of 2018. And uh, all three of us were actually partners in another company. So mm-hmm. me, Rob, and Tom were partners. When did we start on? Was that like February? That May. Year? It was May. May of that year. Mm-hmm. So uh, once I once I was bought out of those companies, then Rob said, hey, let's start a fund and let's start buying some let's let's actually do some real buy and hold and then that's how we that's how we ended up partnering up so you had a pretty big operation you were buying what flipping a hundred houses uh, a month or a year a year a year 
And so you live in Houston. Did you have a come to Jesus meeting at Joe Osteen's church to say, hey, I'm going to just switch this whole thing over? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I, I sat down. <laughs> yeah, Kanye was there. It was great. So uh, I sat down. with. Actually, you want to tell the story? You tell that sure. story better than so, I do. So um, while these guys were doing their, their – they were teaching flipping and wholesaling, I was – I had a small mastermind in California. We were starting to buy and hold. And I asked Jason to come out because we were looking at Houston. So he came out and he was just talking about the market. And he was talking about this property he bought on Wood Oak and how they picked it up for 80 and they only put like 12 or 15,000 in and they sold it for one, uh, for 120 and everyone was happy and it was a great deal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, and, and then he said, you know, so there's this, but if I had held it today, that's what he said, mm-hmm. five years later, if I held it, I would have had eighty thousand dollars in equity, and I'd be cash flowing like eight hundred, nine hundred bucks uh, a door. And I just said from the audience, because I'm a bit of a smartass, I said, "Hey, man, what if you had just kept twenty five of those a year? Let's all do the math." <laughs> so everyone in the audience starts like, taking out their cell phones, and we're doing the math, and we're like, "Okay, so that would have been one hundred twenty five with this amount of equity, and one hundred twenty five with this cash flow." And I said, "Hey." Jason, it would have been $11 million in equity and $91,000 a month in cash flow. And uh, then Jason said, any questions? Everyone raised their hand. He said, nope, no questions, and walked off the stage. (laughs) (laughs) Had that epiphany that was, hey, this is the, the wrong way he's going, so. Oh, man. you So you were the, the a-ho that, that brought him to senses, huh? Like hey, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, and I, I, I had a little fun with it, but it was all for uh, all for the best at this point. So I, I called my business partner right then. I walked off the stage, walked out of the conference center, and I called Tom and I said, "I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just done." <laughs> so it took us like about eight or nine months to negotiate the sale. But I, I told him, I said, "Look, dude, this is absolutely this is absolute insanity." I said, "We." We do so much volume. We could easily make a few million dollars a year in equity. if We just held on to a couple of these things. And so I gave him three options. I said, look, you can, you can buy me out. We have a push pull agreement in all of our businesses. So I said, you can buy me out, but here's the problem. I'm not a buyer. So that's going to kind of screw up the push pull. I said, we can liquidate everything and go our separate ways. Or the third option is, We consolidate all three of these companies and really focus on building our wealth. And then the secondary piece is, you know, doing the flipping and wholesaling. And um, he just got to the point where he said, you know what, I'm just going to buy you out. I said, okay. So uh, that's, that's what ended up happening. So. Yeah. It's been about a year, right? It's been a little over a year now. So what did you do right after the sale? Did you take a little time off or um, what exactly did you do? No, I started buying. <laughs> he started buying houses. <laughs> I bought like four duplexes in one day, and then like that next month, I bought like three or four more houses. I mean, we've just been buying, buying, buying. In fact, I, I don't know what my former partners. I, I don't know what the volume of business they're doing now, but I mean, we we bought how many doors are we up to now? With the Airbnb and everything, we're over a hundred. Yeah, I mean, we bought over a hundred this year. And we don't have that big infrastructure. It's me and Rob and a couple of project managers, and yeah. that's about it. I mean, there's we, we built a real machine over here. And I think our equity, I think we made three million, three and a half million. A little over four. Yeah, yeah, a little over four million dollars in equity this year. And uh yeah, it's it's working out real well. <laughs> yeah, I didn't take any time off. I got right back to work. So what so are you buying single family home duplexes or are you doing big apartments? Um to do Airbnb and all that stuff. So we've got a mix. We do, we like Airbnb and the, what we like to call the affordable house model. So we look at uh, properties that, you know, they're, how would you describe this? D-class neighborhoods and we take them up to C's. That's probably the best way to describe C+. it. C plus. Yeah, C plus. So we're doing mostly small apartments. We find that's a, a right market uh, with for disruption. There are, you know, 10 units here, five units there, six units there, uh, small houses, larger houses for Airbnb. So that's that's principally what we've been buying over the last year. So small, smaller size apartment, those are a nightmare to manage. Do you have a management in place? Or? 
that, but we, we're, I guess we're the only ones that don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Our 13 unit got leased up in what, like a week? Six weeks, sir. Yeah. We, we leased up 13, six weeks, and that's all right. Well, I mean, so before we go in and did anything, we made sure we had a uh, construction crew, a, a reliable one, and that's proven very difficult. Um, a good property manager, that's been pretty easy. We've got yeah. three in the markets that we're in all do different types of properties. Uh, once we felt comfortable that, Hey, we could get the, we can get the capital to take these down. We can get the refinancing out. We've got okay crews and we've got good property managers. Let's now what's, what's left to do? Nothing. Just buy as many as you possibly can. So we like them because we get them cheap. Um, most of them are owned by it's either grandma herself or the granddaughter and neither one of them want to be the landlord anymore. And, um, you know, they're free and clear for a long time. They don't know what to do with them. And, uh, you know, there's six units available and only two are paying rent and nobody knows how to do the eviction because it's the second, second hand of, uh, uh, of, of management inside the family. And we pick up these deals. Yeah, rents are like eighty percent below market. Oh, the rents are so stuff. so low. Uh, it's, I mean, we the thirteen unit that he's talking about, we had a blended four sixty five, mm -hmm. and now that everything's leased up, we're at eight twenty five. Wow, almost almost double, huh? Yeah, yeah. it's eighty percent. Yeah, hard to screw that deal up, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so well, funny is everybody thinks we're a genius in this marketplace and. I was in Corpus Christi last weekend speaking at an event. I said, guys, we just buy this stuff so low that we can't screw it up. Like there's not really much genius to that. Just pay so little for it that you just don't screw it up. Right. Clean, really nice rehab, but we take the we have identified the top five um items that break down, just the handyman items, ceiling fans, dishwashers, and things like that. We've identified the top five and we don't put them in our buildings. Can you can you share the top five? I'll give you two. It's the ceiling fans, which are nightmares. Uh huh. Right, they're always shaking off because to really install a ceiling fan right, you've got to reframe the attic, and sometimes people don't do that. Um, and dishwashers, dishwashers are a nightmare. So we simply don't uh, give dishwashers, and we don't do ceiling fans. How about disposals? Nope. Okay. No, that is, that's another. That's number three. That will just that is. That's let's see how much crap we can break in the sink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really dangerous, right? Because, I mean, it's always forks and knives and Barbie dolls and things like that. So we just identified the ones that just cause the most um, CapEx and, and maintenance issues and just address them before uh, we allow anyone to move in. So what, what markets are you guys finding these, all these kind of cheap deals? In Houston. Houston, Southeast Texas. All the way down to Corpus Christi, out to Beaumont, San Antonio. How are you finding the funding to buy them, and how are you marketing to get them? Um, well, we have a radio show, and that really is really our main source. We do uh, a lot of um, education events that no one else is doing. We we fill in a lot of the gaps for investors, and um, you know we obviously are are giving a lot of information away on the radio show in our free webinars and people connect with us that way and connect with us on Facebook and we'll call us up and say, Hey, we have a deal. Um, as far as the capital goes, you know, Jason had a good foothold here with the private investor world. Um, but we're moving on from that. We just created a fund. Um, we've started getting better and better relationships with local banks and so we're able to have some different financial strategies for the different assets we're picking up. So you and Jason created a blind pool to start doing the We did. Funding? Yeah, it's a 506C. Mm -hmm. It's a crowdfunding. We did a blind pool. But we do it a little bit differently. So here's what we do first. We go and we buy the property with a combination of our own money and private lender money. Okay. We start building it, transitioning, rehabbing it, getting people in. And then we introduce it into the fund. And we say, hey, here's what we've done. We've, we've acquired it. This is what we bought it for. This is how much money we put in. This is the equity we believe is in there. Uh, we're going to give everyone some equity. We're not going to sell this at the max number. 
And, you know, half of them are rented, 25% are rented. We need $400,000 to basically do the refi. And if it's a single family, obviously we're getting 30 year fixed. So we need $400,000 to get this into 30 year fixed territory. And I think when people see that, hey, that's actually there, it's mm-hmm. not a spreadsheet. It's not um, some artist rendering of what the property could look like. It's really, really there. And they can get in the truck and we can show them the properties. Uh, makes it a lot easier for people to understand their, what they're getting for uh, their investment versus just, you know, really slick Facebook ads. Right? We don't. There's nothing slick about what we do. It's... Here's the apartment. Seven of the 10 units are rented. And here's what we bought it for. Here's what we put into it. Here's what we like to refi it. That's it. Got it. So your strategy is actually going in. However, you find a deal, you fix it up, stabilize it, and then you introduce it to the pool yes. to cash you out. Yes. You know, like what, what's our worst deal today? A 12 cap? 12 cap, yeah. Yeah. So we're so far above the market on caps. It's not even funny. So. You know, most of the stuff we're buying in neighborhoods that are seven and eight caps. And so we're introducing stuff into our fund at, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 caps. It's a no brainer. It's one of the few funds that uh, when you walk in day one, for every dollar someone puts in the fund, there's a dollar of equity against their dollar in in investment capital. I I don't know any other fund that does that. In fact, all the fund guys told us we were crazy. (laughs) But then the other thing we have is is our target is 20% cash on cash. Okay. So we simply won't raise anything beyond that number. As long as we're staying at a 20% cash on cash projected return, then we feel very, very comfortable that everyone is going to get served inside the fund. How, how are you guys uh, getting paid? We're the last ones to get paid, um, but we also have an opportunity at the end of the fund run to buy the properties if we want them. So it's a long-term, it's a very, very long-term play for us. Um, typically, it's about 5 or 6% to run our fund, and then 9% preferred to our investors. So the remaining 6 or 5% comes to us. Okay. Now, Robert, you mentioned it's a really, really, really long play. But I heard Jason spoke on another episode of um, someone else's podcast that you told him you have about three years. Yes. At, at about 55, you'll retire. So what happened to your funds at that point? Well, it keeps paying me my money. <laughs> that's, <laughs> how, that's how I'm retiring, dude. Uh, listen, I, I, you know, my, my dirty little secret is I, I want to retire early. I'm, as many people come up to me and tell me and slap me on the back and say, oh, Robert, you'll keep doing this. I'm like, no, really, I'm not. I'm not. I understand what it takes. I understand what I have to do over the next three years. I've committed that. It's actually three to five years, and we're going to do it. But at the end of it, I really do want that financial freedom. I really do want to live the life I want to lead, right? And so, um, you know, I spent 10 years. It's a very sad life as a real estate flipper when the smell of cat urine makes your day, right? When you walk into a house and it smells like cat pee, you yeah. know that no one else can buy that house. It's only for an investor, and you feel good about it. That's that's a sad existence, right? So I am that's really money smell. That's, to, that's the smell of money. Here, get it rolling, get it up and running. Make make sure it cash flows, and um, you know, be be good for the next twenty five years of my life. So one of the things that I um, always wanted to know about the Houston market is that you guys have a lot of flooded properties. How do you like buy something like that? Well, let's back up with the with the assumption there. Okay. The assumption, there's a lot of flooded properties. Now, but on a per capita basis, there's not that many of them. There's a lot of them because we got a lot of houses in Houston, right? <laughs> right. But there's not there's not as many flooded houses as you think there there would be. It's it's actually kind of it's actually relatively rare when you go into some of these neighborhoods. So um how do you buy them? You just buy them like any other any other property, depending on how many times it's flooded. The the reality is that it's almost as if the same neighborhoods flood over and over and over again. And then there's some small exceptions where there's some freak storm and you know some certain side of town floods that's never flooded before. But yeah, there's not as many flooded properties as you would think. And 
truth be told, the stuff that flooded in Hurricane Harvey, especially below two hundred thousand dollars, is worth more now than when it was flooded, which makes no sense at all. But that's the reality of it. I, I think I think the marketplace has a short term memory. I think mm-hmm. I think the marketplace after three years forgets that and remembers how horrible it is. But hey, three years later. I'm doing fine. I'm looking for a new house. Uh, things are going good for me. And so for us, um, we're, we're, we're not going to buy anything that's been flooded three, four, five times. And I don't think anyone else is either. Uh, what we're looking to do is if there are places that have flooded once or twice, let's get the elevation levels. Let's figure out if it's something we want to do. Uh, and then, you know, base it on the numbers. If the numbers work, then we do it. If the numbers don't work, we don't do it. I mean, our, our, we're not over, we're, we're not overpaying for, for much these days. And I certainly wouldn't be, be overpaying for a flooded house. Okay. And so next question is more of a personal interest. I'm, I'm let's mm-hmm. say I wanted to go into a, to that market and buy a property that has been flooded and, have just recently flooded like a few months ago you guys had a, a big storm that came through yeah. yeah you know i had a realtor out there from new western she had a sign out said hi we buy flooded houses so let's say you bought something like that you just rip the whole thing out and build it out brand new really depends how how high the flood level is if it went up 18 inches of water which means it hit the outlets then yeah, I'm probably going to gut four feet and below. I'm going to have to change out all those outlets and then I move on. Um, you know, we have an Airbnb property that flooded six feet in Harvey. And um, it was a flip. I was literally, we were, we were supposed to get our granite countertops in and I got a phone call from the, from the fabricator who said, hey, the storm's coming. I'll be down there on Monday. I'm going to take Friday off. And we got six feet of water over the weekend. So I was a house that was already done. I had to gut everything and start all over. Market slipped. I decided to run it as an Airbnb to hold the value and see if I can wait it out. And I can. Um, so it really depends. If it's up 18 inches, yeah, you're going to do a lot of gutting. If it's below 18 inches, below the outlets, not so much. It's just baseboard and, you know. Just dry that damn thing out fast. Right, just dry it out. <laughs> mediate. And most of the floors in Houston, which was a shocker to me, uh, is tile. Yeah, it's uh-huh. all ceramic tile, so you just buff it out, and it's good to go. That's interesting. That's that's good insight to know. I actually went on a property tour out to Houston a few months ago because I'm I'm in Denver. I couldn't buy any flipped um, apartments out here, so I toured the market, and we went to a few areas out there, and um, ended up at the height. And, uh, you know, I saw flippers out there. You guys are, you know, taking small little houses, put a new top and, you know, building it brand new, bigger. And so is that a strategy that you guys are doing uh, at all? If the numbers are right, yes. Um, you know, the, the heights is really clean. So we've expanded out from the heights. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we get a deal. We like it. Sometimes, you know, it's not. Most of our stuff is either going to come from agents who know what they're doing or off market. Um, so yes and no. Um, the Heights is probably a little too much. You know, that $600, $800 million flip is not something we're really interested in doing uh, because you need to have it at a lower ARV. You need to have around 65% because the closing costs will kill you. But that starter home at two fifty dollars to $400,000, yeah, I do that all day long. Is that is that ARV or or your purchasing price? ARV, yeah. Okay. All right. So fast forward to what you guys are doing now. Let's just say someone who wanted to invest in your fund. Um, what are the things that you look for in in this person? That is an excellent question. So we uh, we we don't like to do just blind investments. We want to meet the person or have a conversation. We want to personally go over the downside of everything. Um, just so that, you know, we're all very comfortable. Obviously the PPM has got, you know, here's, you know, I describe a PPM as here's everything that possibly can go wrong. Now give me your money. Right. That's what the doctor. (laughs) Right. Um, but we really want to have a realistic conversation and find out where people are at and, uh, explain it to them. Hey, this is what we're doing. This is, this is the timeframe which we think we'll do it. 
Um, and this is the real numbers. And, you know, we are, we're always conservative in everything we put to the public. Uh, we would much rather overperform, um, underestimate and overperform than vice versa. And when we see some of the documents that come back to us, we just know there's, you know, that 18% return that someone's promising is not real. Right. And so we're going to do this, this, and this, and it's going to be a 12 or 13. And if you're looking for more then you know, obviously the more, the higher return, the higher the risk. Right. And so we like to sit down with people and explain, this is exactly what we think is going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, here's what we're going to do. And uh, that's, that's the most important thing that dealing with us, we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. The communication is, is, is done well and often. And, uh, and then, you know, they, then they have to be, you know, an accredited investor uh, for the fund or a sophisticated investor for uh, some of the syndications uh, that we, we, we put together. But, you know, we, we talk to investors every week every, from the radio show, from the Facebook lives, they're, they're hitting us up and, you know, the, the guy was looking for the 25% return is probably not a good fit for us. What's the minimum investment that um, you're looking for? On the fund, it's $25,000, but we talk in $100,000 tranches. Most people, that's not a problem to, for the for the $100,000, but it's as little as $25,000 uh, for a share. Um, that's what we're looking at. That's the minimum. But again, most people are in $150,000, $300,000. It's... It's not that we'd rather have, you know, 10 people in at 200,000 than 50 people in at, you know, 25 or whatever it is. So it's a lot of, a lot of dormant IRA money that's just sitting out there. They can't do anything with it. Yeah. It's just too much of that stuff is just sitting out there. And so, you know, we'll do 25,000, but we would prefer a hundred. Okay. So prefer a hundred minimum. You, you would talk to them at 25 K. Yeah, of course. Yep. Okay. But they have to be accredited, though, right? They have to be accredited. Yeah, we have a syndication deal that we're we're also running, but I, right now our focus is the fund. They have to be accredited. They have to have million dollars in net worth, not including their own personal residence, two hundred thousand dollars annual income for the last two years as a individual, or three hundred thousand as a household, and we can have a conversation. And your fund is specifically set up to buy uh, rental properties, or do you? plan on doing some uh, hard money lending at all uh, also? You know, not in that fund. No, no. Our, our fund right now is set up very specifically for uh, that one to four and small apartment market. And it's it's buying and holding and watching the equity grow. Okay. So for someone who is newer, let's switch gear a little bit. They want to follow your footsteps. What are the top three things that they need to have? <laughs> quality or skill set yeah it's, it's, it's resources Jeez, similar to that. <laughs> it, here's what they need they need a six figure income they need to have w2 income at six figures they need a 700 fico or better and they need about fifty thousand dollars in capital ready to deploy if you don't have that you wind up very very frustrated that sounds like the requirement for um for them to join your mastermind that is, is that it. right yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Because the reality is, is that the, the likelihood that someone does not have those three things being successful in this business is almost zero percent. Yeah, it's really hard. I, I've coached hundreds of people. In fact, if you go through all the different programs and different groups I've been, it's in the thousands. And if you didn't, if you didn't tick all three of those boxes or at least two, there's no way you're going to be successful. Now. Granted, well, there's outliers. There's the outliers. Great there's, stories. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, we have a good friend of ours. He went to prison twice. I mean, right. he lived in a, a freaking shack behind his mom's house. I mean, he's wildly successful now, but they'll make a movie out of that guy, right? That's not normal. Uh, the reality is that someone thinks they can, quote, hustle their way to success in this business. Sorry. It's so rare. It is so oh, incredibly man. rare. So. You really have to tick all three of those boxes, if not at least two of them, and be yeah. close to the third. So you don't think that someone can just out hustle and and you know wholesale their their way to riches? Yes, well, one, well, well I'd say roughly five out of a hundred people can. But you you gotta understand, there are guys like us out there that have got the money, have the resources, and we hustle ten times harder than those guys ever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the rich guys aren't hustling. That's bullshit right there. Yeah. The rich guys are hustling twice as hard, 
They're twice as smart. They got all the money. Like people think like, oh, I'm just going to hustle. I'm like, dude, you got to be smart and you got to be wealthy and you got to and you got to work hard. And it doesn't matter at what level you're at. You're going to have to work hard. You know, um, uh, uh, my buddy, uh, Kent Clothier, one of one of my friends in this business, uh, stands up on stage and tells tells people, hey, nine out of 10 of you are going to fail. Straight up tells them. And and of the 10 of you that buy the, the 10 percent of the audience that buy this box. 80% of those people aren't even going to open up my program, right? And so it's it, it takes discipline, right? I think that's that's the real key is discipline and resources. And if you don't have that, then I think you are uh, susceptible to that emotional sales pitch that they make at the front of the room and send you to the blue suits at the back of the room. And they try and get you to take another credit card or extend a credit on your, all that nonsense. Um, that's just, that's all pipe dream stuff. I think that is a massive failure and a, and a real problem in our industry. I can name, I, you can name one guy that let's say became wildly successful in real estate and didn't have those three things. Right. I can literally name a hundred more that had that. Right. Yeah. I mean, look at uncle Grant, right. I yeah. mean, he was pulling down some pretty serious money at those car dealerships. Right. And yeah. he started investing in apartments sure. and all that. Uh, all the multifamily guys I know were all like engineers, sales management guys that were pulling down good salaries, that had good credit. I mean, just the, the and, and I will tell you this, I am very skeptical of the claims people make until they start posting P&Ls and HUDs and all that. And what, one of the things that Rob and I have found, and Rob knows these guys more than I do, is that there's a whole community out there of really successful investors. And we all use pretty much the same five or six CPAs, right. the same five or six syndication attorneys. Right. The same. I mean, like, you, there's a level you get at when there's no less than a dozen of these high end service providers. So if someone says, "Oh yeah, I'm killing it. I'm making you know five million dollars a year in wholesaling," which I know is BS, or I'm making five million dollars a year in apartments, we just have to send out an email, send out a couple of text messages, and we'll know if it's true or not because. There's only so many people that provide the services to be able to close those deals nationwide. Right. And if you're not using this person, you're not using this person, you're not doing that. Well, how are you doing your syndication? Right. Who's your syndication attorney? Or my favorite, just call the title company. Like what title company are you closing at? Because they'll, they'll, you know, most title companies will tell you, oh yeah, I know Bob. Yeah, we closed 10, 10 of Bob's apartments, you know, in the last yeah. years. So again, you, you, you might pick up our, our skepticism in that real estate <laughs> education world. And so we just, you know, because we, we, we both spend a lot of money on, on, on our programs and there's always something good there, but uh, we don't think there's anything that really shows you how to build wealth, like, like what we're doing. And um, quite frankly, we don't have the time to sit down and teach people step by step by step. That's why we do a mastermind, which we think is a much better format for what we're trying to do. And even still in the mastermind, you know, we're, we're really, we've really got to push people to, to take action and, and break down those fear barriers and all that good stuff that everyone goes through and have, has to overcome. Uh, so again, well, that, I mean, you look at the guys that are in our mastermind, it's pretty freaking hardcore. I mean, yeah, they're all business owners are very successful people, yeah. right? So they've, they've succeeded somewhere else brought those real those resources to real estate and are now building out their portfolio. You know, that's a good point. When I look at the people who are successful in real estate, a lot of times they've demonstrated success somewhere else in their life. Yeah. So it's easy to bring you just got to bring over the real estate skill sets. Right. So many of these guys that are looking for their ticket out of poverty with real estate, I'm like, man, brother, you are so far behind. Just one of the things I like that you said is discipline. So many people lack discipline. And how do you teach discipline? I mean, and that's really tough, right? I mean, I'm right. not a psychologist, so I can't, I can't teach you how to be disciplined. But if I got somebody who's disciplined, typically they've got some little bit of net worth and they got pretty decent credit. They've got a pretty decent job between them and their spouse. And so that's a, that's, and if they continue that discipline through real estate, they're going to be successful. But man, that is a tough road to hoe if they've just never been successful in anything in their life. Right. It's just, it's really, really tough. Um, our recommendation has been for years now, go become a real estate agent. Yeah. I mean, if you can't be successful as a real estate agent, you have no business being a real estate investor. 
<laughs> a real estate agent, not, and I, we love our agents. We have a team in Keller Williams. They're Platinum, great. They're fantastic. But I will tell you the difference between being an agent and an investor, like a, a bad real estate agent has a 50% close ratio. Yeah. And a really phenomenal, like my former business partner, Tom, he was one of the best kitchen table closers I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of them. He is one of the best. And he may close two in 10, 20%. As a real estate investor, buying him at 70%, 65% ARV, and he is absolutely one of the best. He's been a sales guy for like a gazillion years, right? Ever since he was like 10. Yeah. And and a bad real estate agent closes 50% of the time. And what's what's Rich close at? He told us the other day. 85, 85, 80. 85, 85. Yeah. So a good friend of ours who was rookie of the year for his KW office, and he still doesn't think he's that good. He closes 85% of the time. So it's like... If you want to start to build, I would, this is the, the story I've been telling for years now. Don't be a real estate wholesaler. Go be an agent. For sure. Go be an agent. You know, get that sweet income. If you really hustle, like really hustle, you can close 85% of those deals and then take the deals down that are good deals and then get into a network. We're big fans of KW. It doesn't matter. You can be in Remax. You can be in, you know, anybody else. Yeah. We just prefer the KW system. Uh, plus they do have the absolute best training on the planet. So, uh, like I said, these folks that don't have any discipline, they don't have any money, they don't have any resources, like start as an agent first, you know, feed your family first, then let's start building a real estate empire from there. Yeah, we usually start our, our education um, seminars or webinars. If you need $10,000 in the next 30 days, you should leave now because this is you're in the wrong room. Oh, I'm so <laughs> I did that. One of the, I was doing a seminar. There were 100 people in the room. And we were taking questions. It was the last day. Guy sitting in the front row, VIP. He was like, if I need 10 grand this month, what do I do? And I said, get a job. Yeah. And everyone went, the room went completely <laughs> silent. <laughs> it's not a hustle. Like, that's what, this is my side hustle. This is not a Gary Vaynerchuk side hustle. This is a business, and you got to take it damn seriously. And most people don't. They don't have the, the capital. They don't have the liquidity. It's a freaking business. Yeah. It's like saying, I'm going to open a restaurant and I don't have any of my own money and I don't know how to run a restaurant. I don't even know how to make, you know, a chicken sandwich. And it's like, this is a business. You got to take it seriously. And and, uh, and I really wish the real estate education world, although I can't fault them because most educators don't do real estate, right? Because they don't know what it takes to actually be successful in this business. So I think that's that's part of the problem. They buy four or five deals a year and Everybody thinks they're a genius, but it, it's a little bit more skill set than that. And, and I'll just wrap this up by saying, it, you know, I started with a half million dollar hole, right? So I was in the hole, half a million dollars. And I hustled and I still hustle every single day. And the absolute fear and dread and the, the cost uh, between uh, my relationship with me and my wife, the person who, who loves me the most and is there for me every single day, the last person I see at night, the first person I see in the morning, um, I don't wish that on anyone. It's a it's very, very, very steep price to pay. And Jason's right. Had I, If I could do it all over again back in California, I would be selling and buying houses along the coast from Malibu yeah. all the way down to the beach communities. I would want right into Keller Williams or another real estate agent, and I would have, I would have done it that way. I'd be done already. I'd be done. Oh, yeah, easily. You sell ten houses a year, you're crushing it out Absolutely. there, right? Just, oh yeah, you, you you know, with the price point out there, you'll be making a lot of money. So, since we talk about the mastermind that you guys are are having in your company, can you share a little bit more information about that mastermind? What's the format uh, and how to uh, get more information? Yeah, you you can text us at two eight one four zero one. Nine zero zero eight. Don't call. No one's picking up. Just text it. Um, <laughs> you can leave a message, but we're not going to pick it up. You, you know, here's the thing. Um, you know, the the joke line is this. Um, we're just looking to put together two hundred millionaires over the next five years, and we want to do it through buying and holding real estate. And it doesn't take a lot. You know, four single family properties this year will you'll have your million dollars in equity in five years, right? So that's on paper. And the joke is, if we can get 200 millionaires around us in the next five years, when we totally screw up and are broke again, we have 200 people we can go to to borrow from, right? And so that's kind of the joke line. But the seriousness about it is we're in a marketplace with a lot of educators and a lot of host houses 
and a lot of investors and a lot of people that want, want that financial freedom, want that early retirement and are poorly served. And we looked at it and we said, hey, do we want to do a $25,000 price point? We want to do a $20,000? What's the number? What's our price point on it? And we just said, it doesn't need to be a lot. We just don't want to go into our own pocket to buy the hotel room, you know, the rental hotel rooms to pay for the, the happy hour. So we're at $7,500. There's no, there's no blue suit in the back of the room that's going to pull you aside and make you fill out an application to try and figure out how much you can afford. It's 7500 bucks. If you can't afford $7,500 to get into the mastermind, then it's not for you. It's, yeah, real estate investing is not for you. It's <laughs> not for you, period. <laughs> You have the money. If you cannot spend seventy five hundred dollars, right? This is not. For it's you. not for you because right? <laughs> you're going to lose more than that over the course of two years in EMDs and option fees because deals didn't work out. Right? You're going to have to be get, get aggressive to get some of these properties. So we do a quarterly mastermind. We do a Friday and Saturday. We lock ourselves into a hotel conference room, go through it. We have some some anchors, some, some heavyweights that come in and provide some key knowledge for us. We do some exercises um, this this weekend coming up. Next week, we're going to do a um, a whole a half a day Friday afternoon on these small apartment syndications and how to do that affordably and not to get blown out by legal fees and all that other stuff, how to do that in a very sort of succinct way. And uh, we have a little thing that we've kind of worked on with our lawyer so it'll be easier for our folks to get into that. Um, and then we do one full day of where are you at in your, in your portfolio build? What are your challenges? How can we help? Who do we have to match up with to get beyond that? And that's the second day. Then in between those quarterly events, people come by our office for, we'll do a little happy hour. We'll do a brunch on Sunday morning at my house. Just come by my house on Sunday morning and do a little brunch. I can guarantee you no one's going to to Uncle Grant's house for brunch, right? Yeah, so you, you come to our house for brunch. We have open office hours and we do a webinar. And most importantly, it's 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 WhatsApp. Everyone's blasting stuff. Everyone's looking at deals. Uh, very active group. So far, 75% of our, um, our members have gone, uh, taken those steps forward that they need to. Now, some of them haven't gotten houses, but at least they've got the pre-approval. At least they've identified the cash and, and gotten the reserves lined up. And so they're taking the steps that they need. So, and then the 25% that haven't, you know, we, I usually do a phone call once a month. Hey, what's going on? And it's, it's, I'm transitioning or, um, Hey, I'm sorry, my mom's sick. You know, it's, it's legitimate reasons, not I'm afraid. Right. So we, we help those people break down those barriers, uh, like a mastermind should. And, um, that's the format once a, once a quarter and then these sort of informal semi-formal events uh, in between a webinar once a month and then we just give out give them access to our entire network so what you mentioned earlier is really interesting about how to do syndication for smaller apartments yeah because they, I understand the syndication fee could could eat you up yeah like if you if you went to someone like a Jillian Sedodio Mauricio role you know your fee, their fee is not cheap. Not at all. I, <laughs> yes. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I never buy lunch when Jillian's around. I've given her <laughs> enough of my money. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So we, we sat down with her and I posed that exact question. How can we do it and not get feed to death? And we went back and forth and I brought in my accountant uh, my tax advisor, a guy named Stephen Hall from Robert Hall and Associate, go look him up. And we we worked out this little this little mechanism that we think um, we'll we'll go through the final the final thing this Friday, but we think it'll keep syndication costs for multiple deals um, under fifteen thousand dollars. Wow, that is cheap. Right, and that's something that we've developed in our mastermind with with the folks around us, and uh, we call it—I don't know—we're we love the names. We call it liquid syndication. But, but this, all the gurus are going to be teaching this five years. Yes, now. don't don't be surprised if you start seeing it <laughs> pop up on Facebook everywhere, and the gurus got a new thing. But we we worked out this little thing that makes a lot of sense, 
and we take advantage of some of the Trump tax changes and work on some different things and say, this is how we do it. And uh, we're off and running. 2020, we should be able to uh, get a bunch of these done. So we're excited. That's awesome. So I want to transition to a little bit of a, a negative here. I don't want to be like a Debbie Downer, but I just want to know from Robert, Jason, what's been the most profound story that you have learned in this business thus far? I'm real pissed about the bank situation. Right. <laughs> so, boy, that's a good one. I'll, I'll expand on Jason's there. We, we, we started dealing with local banks, and uh, there's a big difference between a 20-year amortization and a 25-year amortization. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, we joke about it also. The job of the underwriter is not to give you money. Right. Uh -huh. Right. The, role of the underwriter is, is, is to protect the asset. And the easiest way to protect the asset is not to deploy it. So we, uh, you just want to go through that little nightmare? Well, I, we had a handful of uh, lenders that we worked with, some national lenders that uh, wanted to go with us as we transitioned into multifamily. And uh, there were a handful of deals that we bought all at once. These were, if you can believe this, 65% ARV apartments. I mean, that's how wow. low it was. It was absolutely insane. And uh, and they left us at the altar. And before we met with a, a local bank in, in two of our submarkets who said they would have done those deals, and they've done those, like, they literally like, yeah, we closed two last week and three the month yeah. before and all that. Uh, these guys left us at the altar and, and subsequently killed us by about fifty thousand dollars in EMD. But one of the things I'm finding is that people who call themselves mortgage, mortgage brokers are now, in my estimation, lower than wholesalers. Like wholesalers, whether they're naive or they're just straight up lying, a lot of times their deals, their numbers don't make sense. I think a lot of it's they're just naive. But um, these mortgage brokers will tell you time and time again they can get a deal done. And I have no idea. There's a cottage industry out there that teaches people how to be a mortgage broker, even though they don't like, it's just like wholesaling, but it's wholesaling money. Right. And, right. Uh, we were lied to so many times it, it costs us big time. So that that's probably the most painful story we had this year, uh, which really got us into the mortgage business. So it's, uh, I don't know. Anytime we, we take a lick like that, my, my next thought is, all right, now I'm going to make 10 times that, um, I'm going to make 10 times that, you know, doing something else with it. So um, that's the most kind of poignant story I can think of lately. You got, you got another one, Rob? Uh, yeah. When that, when Harvey came through, we had a couple of projects that we should have immediately cut the cord. Oh, just dumped them right just there. Just dumped them right there and told our investors, this is an act of God. There's nothing I can do. Instead, what happens is we help, we hold on to them, trying to raise them up. And we, we haven't, we've still held on to them, but, I've had to put my own personal money into the deal to keep the investors afloat. I don't mind it. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it'll say something about who I am and, and our organization. But man, that, that really sucks to take some steps back when it's nothing that you had control over. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that, oh, a property floods, I have flood insurance. Flood insurance covers the actual damage. It doesn't cover the loss in value. Yeah. And a lot of the properties, I, I lost a quarter million dollars on one house that got flooded during uh, Harvey. And uh, there's no insurance for that. There's yeah, absolutely none. There's, there's none of that. So at that point, you know, um, that was that was a tough one. And I decided to put my own money in to keep my, my investors whole. And uh, I'm not saying I would have done it any differently, knowing what I know now. I probably would have structured my debt a little bit differently with them. I probably would have used the opportunity to restructure debt instead of being tied to the original because it was an act of God. It was something that I had no control over. I mean, if I pick the wrong contractor and he, he knocks the whole house over on its side, yeah, that's that's my fault. But six feet of water wasn't my fault, right? right. So I, I probably would have renegotiated at that point instead of um, holding on and dumping my own money into it and keeping the same terms. That was... I should have taken advantage of the opportunity to renegotiate the terms and protected their assets um, while not losing it instead of just carrying forward like, you know, for some reason I'm a, I'm a real estate hero here and I could I could fix this because I've been doing it for 10 years. So that was the most recent. That was three years ago. 
So going forward, Jason, what are you going to do differently to make sure that you have the funding in place? <laughs> oh, no, I'll tell you exactly what I would have done differently. Uh, you know, most of the deals I did throughout my career, I raised 100% private money for. If I had known it was going to be that much of a shitstorm, I would have raised 100% private money and, uh, and it would have never been a problem. In fact, we're doing that in most of our deals. We're raising private money to take them down and then we'll throw them into the fund and refinance them. So I will never be beholden to a broker, a broker for the rest of my life. When so, I, I, we met with a guy that recently and he was like, yeah, I'm a broker. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't even want to have a conversation. I'm like, right. I, I want to talk to the adults. Let me talk to the underwriters because I'm really not interested in having a conversation about what you may or may not be able to do. We go through the whole process and then all of a sudden it falls apart in the 11th hour. I mean, it, it was so... On all these guys, it was so ridiculous that uh, I'll just raise 100% private money, we'll stabilize it, and then we'll go to a bank for the long-term financing. And so what ca- what priced range are you buying um, these properties at? We typically end up somewhere between a million and two million in ARV, if you will. We pick them up for typically about 30000 or less a door. Okay. Um, with a $50,000 you know, ARV per door, if you will. And in some okay. cases, uh, as, as high as $92,000 a door is the ARV, and we pick those up at 50, 50 a door. Yeah, so it's, it's not like a hard race for you then. I mean, with the f- infrastructure in place, I'm sure it's a pretty easy race for you. Yes. Yeah. No. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> now, before I uh, wrap up, I have one question for each of you. Now, so for Jason, um, what exactly is your biggest fear? Um, I think my biggest fear is, uh, how can I put this? Uh, you know, you can get a really big head and be a gigantic jerk. Like you can be a real arrogant, you know, I'm the best. Thing SOB, since, yeah. Yeah, SOB. That's actually my biggest fear. I'm not worried about market changes and what happens if we don't raise money or we lose money. Or I'm not worried about any of that. It's, it's becoming a giant SOB. <laughs> well, I mean, you become like a polarizing figure, it's like you know the president. Yeah, well, oh, we're extremely polarizing. <laughs> we're we're definitely polarizing. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, as for Robert, um, what are the one to three books that have greatly influenced your life? Ooh. Let's see. Uh, I. I was a, a very, very, very big fan, and I think we we employ it here of Rocket Fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a book about how to do partnerships. You know, um, the best way to describe my uh, our relationship here as partners is I take care of today, and Jason takes care of tomorrow. Right. So yeah, uh, I think that is right in line with Rocket Fuel. Um, let's see what else. I think. Let me get a little existential on you. The 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 Tao of Poo was big for me, and and uh, any like Siddhartha, you know, just sort of Eastern philosophy and understanding. Uh, there's stuff you can control, stuff you can't control, but it all sort of happens, and just to sort of make sure that we're staying right in the middle and not not going to extremes. So uh, there's a little Buddhism right there. And then, you know, the other fun book that I I think I was looking, and I always mess up the title, but it's You're Not as Smart as You Think You Are, or You're Not So Smart, which really tells people that, you know, eyewitnesses are horrible, right? Their failure rates are eyewitnesses. We we, we all have selective memory. Um, our, Our gut instinct is usually wrong for most people. And so it's it's stuff that sort of humbleizes me. So you're not so smart. You're not as smart as you think you are. The Dow of Pooh um, and Rocket Fuel. Stuff that just kind of keeps me grounded and, 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 and humble because, you know, again, I could get up there too and puff my chest out and say, I came out of this. Look how horrible my life was. And now it's all great. And I go to Disney World and I've got dogs and all, you know, all those pictures up there. And it's really just stay in the middle. Stay focused, keep moving on. And so that's the stuff I like to read. None of the stuff, none of the crush it, kill it, all that. Other, there's none of the, I'm not. <laughs> all that nonsense. Yeah, it's all nonsense. 
Well, awesome. Thank you, you guys, so much for taking the time to be on with me today. I learned a lot of information, great insights from you guys. Thank you for your time. Hey, man. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of the show. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a five stars rating and review on iTunes for the Real Estate Lab podcast. Until next time, have a prolific week.